Okay, so let's start. So again, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to open this OSLC, OSLC Fest. And uh, as Axel uh, presented my role, I am uh, working a lot with, with, with our customers on uh, deploying lifecycle solutions. And uh, in the recent uh, couple of years, more on, 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 on digitizing their entire life cycle. So I am a big advocate of OSLC. Uh, I talk today, we'll talk about this topic, which uh, the motivation to, to digitize the entire engineering life cycle and, and basically give a high level view of how I see OSLC uh, supporting it. Uh, so, yeah, just, you know, the standard introduction, we all know that, that uh, the, 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 the engineering team, engineering manufacturers are uh, facing uh, increasingly growing challenges a lot around the uh, uh, complexity and also uh, technology, uh, uh, technology uh, evolution, pretty rapid technology uh, evolution. Uh, you can see on the right side, the famous exponential curves of line of code in, in aircrafts and in automobiles. And so, so one of the, the first and the primary uh, challenge is, is how we, we deal with all, all of that complexity uh, and how we accommodate it in our engineering process. The next, uh, um, the, 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 the next uh, need is, is, is what I call the need for speed. Uh, and markets are becoming more and more competitive, uh, both from commercial and also from all kinds of environmental uh, uh, changes, like for example, zero emissions. Uh, if we talk about defense, then there's uh, upcoming defense threats coming all the time that need to be responded. So clearly there's a strong need with all that complexity to also be able to deliver products faster. And then the next area, uh, which is evolving and is, is taking bigger and bigger chunk of the, the engineering budget that this is this whole business of uh, regulations. So at least in the industries that I am involved with, which is the complex system industries, uh, they are also regulated industries. And uh, they have industry uh, recommendation, industry practices, and, and the whole cost of uh, proving compliance uh, can be very, very significant if it's not done. Uh, effectively, and uh, now there's also uh, new uh, co compliance uh, standards, especially around cybersecurity. So almost each one of the domains has a new cybersecurity uh, compliance uh, standard. And now, if we talk about machine learning and and and, and AI, then uh, some of the uh, s s some of the uh, domains or, or the industries already starting to introduce new uh, new requirements or new standards about how to deal with things that are driven uh, by machine learning, which is not, it's not well, there, there isn't too much experience with that. Um, and then there's also the, the challenge of finding skilled engineers. So, so the efficiency is always needed. Uh, uh, because uh, the finding skills is is not easy. Uh, so th this is the high level motivation. And if we look at the current practices uh, today, if we look at engineering environments, and I'm talking about uh, complex system engineering, which is multidisciplinary. Uh, so we we have the the whole system engineering disciplines that. Uh, typically includes model-based engineering, requirements management, and then verification validation. And then we have more the, uh, the implementation disciplines, whether uh, we talk about agile software, talk about electrical, mechanical, and then there's the whole simulation domain. So uh, as you can see here in the picture, you see those walls. This is a silo, typically siloed environment. Uh, 
Here and there, you, you can see uh, attempts to create integrations. Maybe not all the tools are siloed. In if, if, you, if you look around, uh, maybe there will be some 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 point to point integration, but in in general, if we st still look at the practice today, uh, we can say that it is mostly uh, a siloed, uh, meaning there's no digital connectivity between all the data across all, all these different uh, do domains, uh, and, and that clearly has it doesn't help the cause, right? So it, it doesn't help to to move faster, and uh, uh, the, the the point where we actually find uh, issues is deferred. So this is that doesn't have this idea of front loading of validation. Uh, the, uh, the the whole cost of, of of compliance can be very expensive because you have to collect data from all over the place. And there's also a reluctance to to change designs and, and, and sort of uh, uh, freeze early on designs because this complexity of all those engineering artifacts, there is a reluctance to, uh, to change. Um, so uh, this is kind of, it's, 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 it's a rough generalization, but I, I would say this pretty much aligns with uh, a big part of the industry is today. And, uh, so the whole initiative, which is called digital engineering, uh, it the, the 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 coin was term in the aerospace and defense uh, uh, industry by the DoD uh, because the DoD is probably the largest consuming consumer of the most complex systems, whether this is space or all kind of of warfare systems, and you know the most of the advanced complex system they are the, the end customer. Uh, they clearly uh, saw that, saw all those challenges, and, and they called out this initiative. Uh, but I have to say, this is not only an aerospace and defense initiative. The, the desire to digitize is actually, uh, we can see it all across the, uh, th those uh, complex system industries, clearly in automotive, and even I would say automotive is a bit ahead because they are in practice have documented practices that pretty much require this so-called digitization of, of the engineering life cycle. And, and here I, I would like to call out, this is a very important chart because the rest of my presentation is talking about those things. So what, what we need to create a digital fabric or to shift from, from this siloed engineering to digital in engineering, uh, this pretty much aligns, not, not exactly the same words with, with what the DOD is, is calling for. So the first one is, is the digital continuity. Obviously we need uh, uh, to create those digital threads and understand all the dependencies, relationship of engineering artifacts across the different domains. So, so this, this very foundational thing of, of wiring together the uh, engineering uh, resources, if you like, using the OSC lingo, uh, is, is a very, very fundamental thing. And, and, and this desire to be able to create digital threads from early conception uh, to uh, deployment and even after is, is, um, is, is pretty much common across uh, all the, uh, across the industry. Uh, the next need, is, is to be able to exchange data across domains, not only link, linking the domains, and, and this is an interesting discussion, especially since OSC is very well known for linking, but exchanging data is also very important. Uh, and I will, I will discuss it in some more detail, but this is definitely a need to be able in a standard way to, to exchange, ex exchange data. And the next, uh, need is, is to ensure data cons consistency. And uh, um, there is a concept coined by the DOD, which is called authoritative sources of data. So if we look at all those data providers like MBSC tools or, or simulation tools or uh, requirements tools, each one is considered uh, the authoritative source of its, its data. And, and the, the question is how we, we manage manage all this business of uh, 
uh, making sure that um, this authoritative data is, is handled properly. And I'll discuss it later. Uh, the next area is be able to do a cost life cycle analysis and reporting. So yeah, so we do have all kinds of authoritative sources and multiple pro providers, but now the question come that we have to do all kinds of assessments and across the entire life cycle, like the, the most uh, well-known example is impact analysis. What happens if I change a requirement, right? Uh, what kind of part is gonna change on my mechanical form, right? So this clearly goes through multiple levels, multiple layers, and, and, and there is such a need, and, and we will discuss how 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 uh, OSC can support it. And uh, the last one is is the process itself. So it's not only the engineering data that needs to be uh, organized together; it's also the process data, and, and this is associating. Uh, things like plans and, and, and tasks with the actual engineering artifacts uh, and also to provide all the transparency of, of the process, which is very, very important if you are in a regulated domain. So this is kind of the, the anchors, if you like, to, to that I will discuss later. Now, clearly, uh, when we talk to uh, uh, to the industry, and it, actually, this is this is a pretty much a picture that I, I saw in one of the US Air Force presentations that they, um, they have all those different providers that you see around. And I, I will actually use this illustration of different tools. And yeah, but there, there are obviously more, many more tools. So if anyone from the vendors around that I haven't mentioned, I apologize, but <laughs> I had the limited space here. so. I, I use some some uh, corn tools. Uh, so uh, clearly there are many tools. Uh, but the point is that the desire was, and this is what I heard in, in an Air Force webinar, and, and this is pretty obvious that they want to create this backbone, if you like, based on open standards. And this is a very important point because there are other solution, at least claimed solutions, which are all based on proprietary technology. And, and, and this means a, co a complete vendor lock uh, for your entire uh, engineering strategy on, on, on this sort of thing in the middle, if it's done in a proprietary way. And I don't want to get to all the, 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 the different approaches, uh, for example, all kinds of enterprise service buses or you know, there, there's clearly some interesting discussion around uh, how PLM tools uh, participate here and, and, and so on. But clearly there's a desire that this needs to be open and also needs to be federated. Again, federated because we want the authoritative sources, these, these, these providers to be integrated. We don't want a solution that the data is copied and managed by a third provider and basically, we sort of lose touch of the original data providers. So this is this is the, the meaning of federation. Um, so obviously, OSLC is, a, is 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 the low hanging candidate uh, to to support it. Uh, so it's clearly uh, it's it's an open uh, open standard uh, based on a federated linked data philosophy. Uh, while it's not very new, the architecture used in OSLC is very modern. It's based on a RESTful architecture, HTTP. So it is still the most modern IT architecture for, for integration. Uh, it, it does, as you can see here, uh, allow integration of, of domains. And, and as, as, as I continue with my presentation, we, we, we will discuss it some more. So the basic idea, as probably most of you are well aware, is, is the idea of linked data. And here you'll see those different uh, providers or authoritative sources of different domain, whether we have uh, 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 requirements or MBSC or simulation or, or software or even change, uh, change, and change management or planning or task management. Uh, 
the, the, the fundamental idea is, is that we create a fabric of data based on, on linked data. We basically uh, externalize the, uh, the resources inside those providers in a way that we can establish relationships across the providers. Uh, so we are sort of removing the boundaries uh, between the uh, between the different providers. Uh, so if we, if we go back to our famous picture of, of the siloed architecture, then the, the first step is is obviously is, is establishing these links across the different resources in the uh, different providers. So this is sort of uh, fulfills this first goal of of, of uh, digital continuity, right? So with that, we establish uh, digital continuity, we create uh, digital threads, uh, and we also implement what we call life cycle information models, which I will discuss in the next chart, I believe. Uh, before that, uh, just a brief reminder for those of you that are new to SLC. So how, how SLC actually facilitate this uh, creation of links across different tools, different providers. So there is a, some important services like a selection service that uh, allows one tool to select data from another tool uh, in order to create link uh, from one uh, resource to, to, to a resource in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the other tool. Uh, and then there is a very nice so is that once we have the links, we want to see what is the other side. So we want to give a, a, an experience as if we are inside one big uh, environment uh, where data can seamlessly be approached and seen regardless of where you are focusing, which tool you are using. And here you see on the, on the right side, and probably I guess in, in, in this event, you, you will see it in different demos. We see an example of a requirement tool that has a link to an MBSC tool. And you see here uh, a previous service where uh, the link from the requirements to this uh, sequence diagram is, is basically rendered. So I don't have to leave the requirements tool. I just put my cursor on, 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 the, on the link and then the OSLC preview service will provide the requirement tool a, a visual uh, so I can see from the requirement tool, the actual uh, model fragment that the requirement refers to. So th this is kind of a, um, two important uh, services in this area of, of linking the data. Um, there's another important thing, which is pretty obvious in a context of, of, of web clients. And, and this is the idea that when we have a link from one, uh, resource in one tool to another resource, we can always perform a cross tool navigation. So if I really want to go and I'm in a requirement tool, I want to go to the MBSC tool. So and instead of using the preview service that allow, allows me to see, but not to modify, I can actually in one click and go and navigate uh, to, to the authoritative source of, of this piece of data. Uh, talking about lifecycle models, so, uh, uh, basically, uh, lifecycle models are very important, uh, especially in regulated industries. So this is an example for automotive, and I made a comment earlier that automotive, I think, are way ahead because their practices are much more prescriptive than if we comp compare the general practices of INCOSI or what we see in aerospace and defense, like uh, the 15288. So here you see a very precise uh, uh, specification of an information model that is required by automotive spies. And what you see here is that we basically fulfill this information model using different OSLC link type and creating OSLC links based on the, uh, the guidance that is coming from automotive, automotive spies. Uh, by the way, if you look at the aviation standards, for example, like T178, for, uh, there is also uh, such a requirement to, for certain traceability, which basically imposes a, a life cycle uh, information model. But regardless of 
regardless of, of uh, uh, regulation, this is a good thing to have because this means that you digitize your data. You have, you organize all your data into one big lifecycle information model. Why it is federated and is it, it is cross cutting across different providers? It is still um, one uh, digital lifecycle information model. Uh, the next uh, topic is, is is how we the need to exchange data. Uh, there are some examples because in general, the philosophy of linked data is not just to copy data between different providers, but the idea is not just to copy the data. For example, if I, 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 I have requirements and I want now, I need to create matching test cases, especially if you're following the V model, you need to make sure that your test cases are driven from requirements. And this is pretty much a common thing in all across the regulated industries. So ha having the pushing requirements data to a test tool uh, is, is, is very useful in order to start automate the creation of tests, right? So clearly there's value of being moving uh, uh, data from one tool to the other for the purpose of automation, not for the purpose of copying, but for the purpose of automation. And here I have another example, which is sort of an example I don't really like. Uh, for example, we know that in, 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 in CSML, MBSC tools, CSML uh, has a requirements representation, but uh, it's very common that requirements are also stored in requirement repositories. So this is another case where uh, the requirements needs to be represented at least uh, in the context of, of CSML. So, so this is the need to exchange all this data and, uh, uh, and how, how we do that. And, I, and here we come to another area, very important in OSLC, and this is the, the sole area of, of data specification. Um, so we have the uh, resource definition language, the uh, definition framework, and, and this is all based on the uh, W3C stack where we can def define standard vocabularies for data, and uh, we can uh, also that there are uh, predefined domains like you can see here, uh, and all those domains have uh, uh, data shapes defined uh, or vocabularies, and we also have a query, a standard query language that one tool can can query another tool uh, to find data. So this is a very important building block in, in this theme of, of how we, 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 we uh, enable uh, data exchange. Uh, yeah, I don't have time. I, I, I put this example of a PLM tool, uh, but the, the, this is just an illustration that we can take even a complex environment like a PLM tool that manages different types of data, for example, like in mechanical, or electrical, uh, we can make PLM tools, and I believe we have we we, we have talk uh, from SBE Vision later in this interesting talk that they will actually uh, demonstrate it. Um, the next area is global configurations. Uh, so clearly, the challenge here is we have all those data providers, but data clearly has uh, different baselines, different configurations, and in in order to talk about consistency across the data we have to talk about the configuration of the entire system, right? So if we talk about baseline of the system, we need to configure, uh, to, to, be, to, to orchestrate configuration across different data providers where each one manages its own data, but we need to orchestrate a configuration which is more global context. And this is very important to resolve uh, links across uh, the, uh, the different domains, as well as to talk about things like baselines, but not only baselines, also uh, we can talk about uh, things like branches and, and, and variants, uh, as we can see here. Um, so um, here we, we, we can basically see an example, and you, you see here are several things that uh, OSC configuration management has this concept of components, and components are uh, basically uh, containers of data, uh, which is configured together, but 
we can create this hierarchy of component like, like a design breakdown structure, if you like. And here you see two configuration of a drone that we call aviary. Um, but the, the fact that this is an hierarchical thing, so we can manage baselines and, uh, and, and, and branches of very complex configuration across the federated data. And, and this is a foundation for, um, uh, for, for uh, uh, also variant management. And I believe there is a, a talk from Pure Systems later on in the program that talk this topic in, in, in more detail. Uh, so here, we, again, this is sort of the elaboration of our digital fabric. And here, in addition to linking the data, we also sort of have this uh, central uh, management of configuration data. I forgot to mention that in order to manage global configurations, you need a global configuration application, which is not standardized by OSLC, but the APIs needed to create such an application are standardized by OSLC. Uh, the last topic is the topic of reporting and, and, and central analytics. Uh, and this is very important because I heard many times I heard comments from, from uh, different tools and different that say, yeah, hey, OSLC is, is only about linking. And uh, there, no, there isn't enough well awareness of what you can do with the track resources set, which is a service that allows you to track data from all across the providers and with that you can create uh, like an analytic repository of what we call in the IBM implementation and uh, uh, index of lifecycle data some sometimes some people call it uh, the lifecycle data graph uh, the ability to create such an index of the data and again this is an index of the data this is not where the authoritative source here, this is data come, which is indexed from the authoritative sources here, is supported by TRS. And this is a very important part because that enables all the idea of doing analytics and reporting across uh, uh, the life cycle. And here I come to pretty much my last chart. Um, and here you can see, and this is, this is sort of the, the, the next elaboration of our digital fabric that we have these connections, we have the global configs, but now we also have used the, the TRS protocol to create a central lifecycle index from which we can generate reports and, and, and analysis like impact analysis and so on. And, and the, later today, I think in one hour, there's a talk by Andy Lapping that is, is demonstrating all this area. Uh, again, the OSLC part here is the TRS protocol. Uh, what Andy will show is actually an implementation we did in IBM, uh, leverages TRS to create a central index. And here you, you, you see, for example, a visualization of digital threads coming from the central index, which is based on the TRS data feed. Uh, and here you can, talk, you can think about this as, as an impact an impact of change, starting from a change request, propagates down to, to the different domains, uh, and so on. This is another example that you will see, I think, in Andy's presentation, which is uh, generating different reports that typically we need in, in regulatory areas, like, for example, uh, requirement traceability reports or system ver verification reports on all kinds of, of, of KPIs or uh, K KPIs that we generate, and this is all coming from this central repository uh, that is, 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 is maintained using the, the TRS feed. Uh, and this is my last chart. So pretty much, uh, uh, I just want to mention, so, so we, we discussed all those key topics of uh, the, the, uh, creating the digital threads, managing the authority of sources in terms of the global configurations, and uh, using OSLC vocabularies to facilitate data exchange and using the TRS to create uh, reporting and cross lifecycle analysis. Uh, then I wanted also to mention, based on our experience, some future work that we like to see in the OSLC community. Uh, one, once based on our experience, 
to implement all the stuff that I mentioned. Uh, we need some additional to standardize some more functionalities, like for example, a link index. And I believe there is a talk later on uh, that, that talks about an implementation of a link index. Uh, uh, also, there is a, a link validity that usually I show, but I don't. I didn't show it in this presentation because it's not a standard OSLC. You need to implement link validity, uh, but it would be nice to to specify APIs for standard services like a link validity service or a link index index service. And then obviously we need, we want to standardize more domains. We want to see domains, for example, for product structure, and there are many more domains to see OSLC fulfilling that, that mission. With that, I, I guess I, I eat up, I eat up my, my questions time, but if there is some, there are some questions, maybe I'll take one or two. <laughs> 